Ramat, and uh, Vakara is uh, my responsibility, and uh, I really enjoy it. And am very thrilled that uh, Lori has been uh, teaching the immersive environment courses uh, over on the other section of Sliss Island. Uh, she's asked me to speak today about uh, an assignment that we call uh, preservation and documentation. Now, first of all, and, and this is the more serious part, we are talking seriously about preservation of um, second life, which I can tell you now is mission impossible. But if we take a look at the archival definition of preservation, this is from the Society of American Archivists uh, glossary online, uh, it really is protecting materials and if you take a look at the definition, minimizing chemical and physical de deterioration, uh, we're talking about physical properties of some of the artifacts, uh, but we're also talking about keeping from harm or injury or decay by protecting it, and in the third, by protecting records and other materials that are relevant, uh, a lot of emphasis on litigation and subject to e-discovery, so that's a whole other aspect of why we keep records, and that's what we're talking about here. But uh, the first two are about artifacts, uh, usually about physical, but now that, of course, we're into the digital age. Uh, we are very concerned about how we're going to protect our digital assets. They are value uh, to us uh, for current uses, but also for future research. So it is a, uh, a quite a complex um, oh, issue to deal with. It is a challenge. Uh, there are three ways that have traditionally, that for years, been discussed as soon as we started getting into the digital environment. Uh, we start thinking, oh gosh, you know, how do we use these digital files in the future? And uh, one thought was emulation. Okay, so what you would do is create a new system to reproduce the functions of the old system that is no longer operable. Uh, I'm thinking of my Pong. <laughs> we had one of the first Pongs that you play back and forth tennis. Uh, and I don't really know that there is a uh, new system that would do that, although they would do something similar, similar game. Uh, but we do have the old one, and it still works. So that's another way to do it is just keep all of your old equipment, right, with your old software. But the other one is migration. Moving the data, if we're talking about the data that we want to protect and not necessarily the software, although we do it with software as well, from one information system or storage medium to another so that you can continually access that information uh, on the system or in the medium, like a disk, um, before it becomes obsolete. So what you have to do is look ahead, forecast how long something would last, and then make sure that it is lasting, it's not deteriorating because of any problems with the physical medium on which it's stored, but also then think ahead and migrate so that you're not a couple of systems behind and it's impossible to migrate. And then of course there's conversion, uh, changing something from one format to another. Um, especially data from an obsolete format to a current format. So you might think of something like PDFs, uh, your Word document. Uh, you might think of taking a Word document and making a PDF out of it. I have to travel on an airline to uh, Canada this week and I've been coughing a little bit and all I could picture is myself being stuck for 21 days somewhere uh, and next week it's to uh, the UK <laughs> so you never know I may never return but now we're taking a look at uh, the preservation and documentation uh, what kind of options are available to us here I'm going to um, Go back a little bit and see <coughs> why this is jumping ahead. This is what you should be looking at. Uh, this is the next slide. Uh, so if someone is moving ahead the slides, please don't do that. Uh, I could have done that on my own. Uh, what this is a uh, form that if you can take a close look at it, not today, but when you have time, this will remain. Uh, the uh, library uh, that has a permanent digital archive, uh, it's a Harold B. Library, and um, 
what they do is have a form, and if someone wants to protect or preserve their digital objects, they really go through a process of asking and answering questions such as, uh, what type of um, material is this? Are we going to save it permanently? Uh, do we really need to archive it or not? Uh, is this a high preservation priority or is it just a normal preservation priority? If we do save it, do we need a high resolution? Now you could think of images here easily. Or would it be a low resolution? Uh, do we want to save it on the Internet Archive so that it's publicly available? Do we have any other ideas about preservation? Um, archival objects, who's going to access this in the future? Is it going to be the uh, archivist only? Is it going to be uh, an audience uh, that may uh, be interested in this? Would it be just on campus if we were doing this for SJSU, or would we invite people from outside of campus to come as well? Uh, public access versions, I mean, we need, if we're going to preserve something, a very high level, high resolution uh, object, but if we're going to provide it for access to the public, uh, perhaps we don't need that same type of uh, object. Perhaps we could make a lower resolution object available to the public now that we're not talking about the uh, second life worlds yet, but we are talking about perhaps digital objects like pictures. Um, what do we want to do with this? Are, are we more concerned when we preserve something? And, and this you could really apply to the Second Life with the intellectual content, but also the look and feel. Whatever we create here today, are we concerned with reproducing exactly what happened here? Or is it okay that we just have a record of the content of what happened? Marie is filming tonight. She's uh, making a video of this, and is that okay? Uh, that will be a documentation of what we're doing, but that's not necessarily re reproducing what we're doing. We can't come back and live it again. Um, what is more important than the content or the format? And then we have to look at cost, too, because uh, storage is not cheap, regardless of the type of storage you have. Now we say it's cheaper than it used to be. That's true, but there's maintenance, and when you start talking about how do I keep this preserved for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years and so forth, that's where the costs come in because you have the human factor that has to keep checking your digital objects and you have the storage that's going to be long term and you have the migration or the conversion, whatever is necessary. So all of those steps have to be taken into account and they add to the cost as well. Now we have some other decisions, and this here is a decision chart. It would help uh, somebody to decide what they wanted to do with their digital objects by asking again and answering certain questions. For example, are the objects available somewhere else? When Marie is making her video, she's going to be uploading it eventually, I think, to the uh, Vakara YouTube uh, channel. So that's one place it would be. Can we be confident if we want to come back and look at that in 20 years that uh, YouTube will still be there and that they will want to keep our video that long, our machinima? If not, do we also want to have another copy somewhere in our own private server that we will make sure is maintained and preserved over the long haul? So those are the kind of questions that will be asked on this decision chart. And I'm not sure if Lori sent you copies of these, but if not, I will uh, get you copies. I can send those to you. Now, this is another um, look at the Minnesota Digital Library, the preservation option, and the date says 2010 because that's when they actually completed this one project. Uh, yes, uh, Lori, I, I will send you uh, a copy then. Uh, so if you take a look at here, what, what we see is that there are different kinds of just JPEGs. Those are your images, you know, your, your files of pictures. And uh, you're looking at how many were transferred just in this one digital uh, library preservation project and uh, that they have many more to go through. And they do mention here a uh, LOCSIS network and OCLC. 
uh, digital archive. Uh, how many of you have heard of Luxus? Any of you? I bet you at least one or two of you have. No? Okay. Um, Luxus uh, is the, uh, <laughs> it's a way to <laughs> think about uh, preservation and uh, safety, security of objects because it means lots of copies keep stuff safe. And so what they're saying there is duplicate, replicate <laughs> your object, uh, just like with that machinima. Keep it on YouTube, but keep a safe file and then maybe keep it somewhere else too. So uh, lots of different copies, lots of copies keep stuff safe, that, uh, keeps uh, stuff safe. Uh, that's all that means. So that's a program that was based at Stanford University Library our uh, neighbor over here. And uh, it does provide libraries and publishers with a low cost uh, open source digital preservation tool to preserve and provide, ac uh, provide access to the digital content. So it is a, a serious project with a uh, very simple name. And then uh, OCLC, Digital Archives, most of you hear that. Um, this is a, a digital archive that will again preserve uh, records. Uh, that are in digital format. Uh, they will be um, presented for an audience through a portal uh, so that collections can be provided to the public. And uh, there are many people wondering not only about preservation, because if you preserve something that's wonderful, but it's not useful, right? You want to be able to provide access as well. So I don't think I like to talk about preservation alone without access, and uh, I certainly can't talk about access without preservation because you've got to keep uh, uh, that material that you want to provide access to in good shape so somebody can actually uh, read it, uh, review it, uh, view it if it's a video, whatever it may be. Now there is a preservation model uh, that uh, is um, thought of when we think about trying to preserve digital objects, whatever they may be. And the uh, concept makes sense in that you want to package this object, this uh, uh, submission information package. You see an SIP up on that slide. Uh, there's your package and you're putting your digital object with all the metadata that it needs that you know about it when you first preserve it into a repository for management for preservation, but also for access, so for two things. So we've got this submission information uh, package, the SIP. We're putting it in our repositories. That's what the ingest means. We're probably adding more uh, metadata to it because now it's inside of a repository and we have things happening to it like uh, access. So we may want to provide management metadata. So we've got uh, uh, metadata being added all the time. Uh, but we have, it turns into an archival information package. And that archival information package is the way it's stored, the way it's preserved inside the repository. But then at some point, somebody wants to use it, access. And so at that point, it's made into a dissemination information packet. And these three packages may or may not be all the same. If we think about just a simple image, that goes in at high resolution uh, and to be preserved for the long term. We then want to provide access to it, but we don't want our people waiting for a long time to view it online. We probably will make a smaller resolution item available to them. So you're going to have maybe even those two versions. Uh, you probably would not have two separate files. What you would have is your uh, high resolution file, but inside of the processing, of this um, repository when the dissemination package is made to go out to the person who wants to view it, it will be turned into a, a low resolution copy at that point on the fly so that somebody can see it very quickly. They could see it well online, see it very quickly, but we are still maintaining and preserving our uh, copy that is uh, has a more resolution to it that uh, will be um, more valuable to us in the future. It's the uh, file that we would have to save for preservation. So then, preservation and documentation, because that's what the assignment is, and they're really two different things. 
preservation means whatever you've created, like those beautiful apartments that you have and the furnishings you put in and uh, pictures you may add or flowers or whatever. If you're creating any of that yourself, you've created something you would like to preserve in Second Life, but it's, it's an object made of crimps and, and you can't really um, preserve it in the way that we're talking about here. Uh, you also are giving a tour of your home and you're talking about your character. Uh, you're not always going to remain in character and so you can't preserve that moment in time uh, just like in real life unless you document it and that's what we're talking about for our assignment is we do have options to uh, at least document what we're doing and we could do that through creating a video and adding some kind of descriptive elements and uh, uh, creating the machinima that uh, we have copies of from other courses that you can see. So what is documentation? Well, documentation uh, can be in any format. Uh, so it could be a text or it could be a photo of something, a mu moving image, a sound, just what I said. Uh, but documentation uh, really are materials that are created or collected to provide the facts for reference. Uh, and uh, they could be citations or footnotes or endnotes when you do a paper, of course. In computing, they could be the instructions, the specifications for the program. So a lot of different ways to look at documentation. The way we're going to look at it here is you put a lot of time and energy into this course how would you best want to document what you've done? Because that has value to you, and it will have value to others who view it uh, once you have created it and we place it in our exhibit because we do have visitors who come and uh, take a look at all the work that uh, has been um, accomplished by our students. So uh, here we go again with some type of um, replication. Uh, when we talk about documentation, we uh, can t uh, prove that we've done something, but we may also want to replicate what we've done at some time in the future. And in the physical world, this happens. I just wanted to share with you this image of a uh, Chinese home. Uh, and the uh, Chinese home was actually uh, taken apart piece by piece, brick by brick, in uh, China. And then it was sent to the United States and it was rebuilt uh, as part of a, um, a museum um, display. Uh, so actually that is one way you can save things is of course by taking them apart piece by piece and then building them together again. Uh, and that can happen in Second Life, but boy is that a problem for us, right? So I wanted to show these shapes because that's what you work with and uh, try to create your objects with and uh, it, it is so labor intensive. And once you do that, uh, you want to be able to save it somehow, don't you? Yeah. Uh, but that, that also is not very easy. That's why we're trying to document at least your work. Uh, there are some, um, of course, uh, different types of services that are looking at preserving uh, the objects that you're creating so that your spaces can be rebuilt, just like that Chinese house was. Uh, and Kitely is one space that allows you to create avatars and uh, what they tell you in that box with the, let me move ahead a little bit to um, there are all the prims that we would be using, but here's Kitely. And if you take a look at that uh, box in the lower left corner there, you see that one of the things that they are promoting is that there's no vendor lock-in. And the reason for that uh, is because this is an open sim and the sales factor for them to get you to go into Kitely is that you'll be able to take your creations with you. You'll be able to take your objects and then you can go back to another uh, system if you would like to. You can move from one to another and still have objects. Uh, and you can, yes, you can save your entire build into one file and that's, that's really the, the neat uh, thing about this. So you're not going back to those pieces, to those prims 
uh, that I showed here because once you get through making all of these different uh, like snow in class two and Maria have been working on the building here in Vacara and had uh, columns and pieces that have been put together over time and we're learning a lot about how we can start uh, making sure that those fit together and remain that way. So here is one uh, example, as I mentioned, of people that are trying to do some work to make it easier for us to be able to preserve our work, even if it's just the objects that we then have to rebuild in another uh, system, if that's the case. And uh, what I liked about this uh, also is that they know that we're using machinima, uh, not we, <laughs> specifically at SGSU, but everybody. We're using machinima in order to document, and uh, they're promoting the fact that there is really good performance in Kitely with no lag uh, when you're using uh, your ultra graphics and your bells and whistles. So uh, the um, idea that at least uh, people who are using um, virtual worlds like Second Life are being listened to, and uh, some uh, progress is being made. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you, I'm just uh, comparing real life with Second Life because that's kind of what we're doing, we're replicating. And uh, when we took apart a Chinese home and moved it all the way to the U.S. and built it back piece by piece, that's pretty much what we try to do sometimes with our builds in Second Life. And uh, it's just as difficult as it was for that Chinese home. You had to at least get uh, Chinese artisans to be able to do that. Uh, well, same thing with making available information to you. Uh, in real life, now that we have uh, the web and uh, we have the ability to digitize, uh, some of the um, museums uh, are preparing, of course, objects, videos that we can view online. And this was an example, I thought, of a very well done one. Uh, there's a clock, and the clock, following up on the Chinese theme, uh, is from China. And in the past, only the emperor would see how beautiful it is. It's just amazing when you watch that clock work. Uh, so there is an animated uh, video for you to watch, uh, an animated version. And it uh, does a real close-up on some of the pieces of the clock. It looks at all of the working parts of the clock. And it even plays the music that only the emperor would have been uh, able to hear and see in the past. So uh, I think this is uh, pretty neat, but it's a way we're doing it not in Second Life, right? Now, what might we do in Second Life, or what have people been trying to do? This is an example of really, really early at Stanford. Uh, you might have heard or read about some of Henry Lowood's work, because he has been uh, working with preserving uh, virtual worlds, but then more into gaming. And uh, they've had several grants, and one of the early grants was, of course, building in Second Life. But they, too, were struggling with how to preserve the work that they had done. And uh, this is an example of one person uh, being videotaped. That was included as part of uh, their memory. So it wasn't just what they created. It was also a memory of a person who worked on this and what did they think about what they had done? What was surprising about working in Second Life? Uh, what kind of barriers did you run into? Uh, uh, what excites you about all of this? And uh, I have uh, seen, and I think Maria just sent you that uh, copy or link to a uh, um, an article. Um, they're looking now at how are we actually um, preserving not just the objects and the builds, but al also the idea of uh, the community that was built. So all of you in here, all of you working in Lori's class are, are experiencing the same thing. And uh, you're building a community and hopefully helping each other and, and enjoying seeing what the others are doing. How, how do you preserve that human element and not just your avatar's view, which can be very different. Uh, my avatar is probably very different than I am in real life. So maybe 
uh, not only would I be speaking as preceptor, telling you how wonderful I think this is, I might be speaking as Dr. Frank saying, well, you know, <laughs> it really is difficult to view because I've got my glasses on here. <laughs> and I, I do get a little bit of a, a motion sickness once in a while, you know. So we, we do maybe want to preserve a little bit of, of the real life aspect that goes into building the second life. You never know. Um, but this is what uh, Stanford did, and they also then, of course, did what we're doing and preserved the videos of the activities. And uh, you'll see that when they did that, they created more of a database so that uh, people could access the uh, videos that they had created. Uh, they uh, do show the um, size of the videos, the original size, if they have an MPEG or something, they, they've got that listed there. So um, you could create if you wanted to, and we have not done this for a class, but you could actually, or, or I haven't anyway, you could actually create a database and you could have links to all of the work. But now what we're talking, and Stanford did that, right? But what we're talking about even after we do that is then how do we make it available for people to view all of our work? Because it's great that it's in Second Life, but what if we want to show somebody that we haven't converted into being a person who loves to be in virtual worlds? Well, that's where they uh, went into the Internet Archive, and they made sure that they had information about this available through the Internet Archive. And uh, so there you have details about your virtual world through the kind of uh, ideas you capture from the people who are working on it, uh, through uh, images of the uh, immersive environment and the uh, avatars that have been interacting in it, and then also available in a way that anybody in the future would be able to view uh, as long as Internet Archive uh, provided a way and somebody cared enough to, to keep moving forward uh, with the video uh, formats so that they are uh, visible in the future. So there's, there's another option, you know, we, we can certainly do a database, but then what do we do with it? Uh, will um, SLIS, now we're information school, will, will we be able to keep it forever on our own servers? Should we be going uh, public with it so that it's much easier to find too, right? People are used to going to the Internet Archive, and it's kind of a structured way to do that. So there's the Internet Archive with the information about Stanford's uh, activities. Uh, and this is something that uh, is an option when you have um, a big project that you want to not only preserve, uh, but you want to make accessible to the public. This I got excited about last year, and you may have seen it already, uh, but uh, someone from Germany, I think, was speaking at a conference I went to last fall, and uh, this happens to be um, Virtual Academy, uh, Academia, I should say. Uh, the link is up there that you could visit, and it is a uh, special uh, immersive environment for academics, and the really good thing about this is that the um, this is built with the classroom in mind so that uh, if you thought you needed something to show a presentation like I am here uh, you would have it within that environment we have to run out and buy things to use uh, but with that it would come with whiteboards it, it would come with a way for you to show videos uh, and that's my um, avatar uh, in the virtual academy there. Uh, and um, you could see a professor speaking to students, everybody sitting in their classroom. Um, it is a 3D environment, but it has some special features. Uh, and uh, one of them is that uh, you can record right from within uh, the environment. So we don't have to worry about setting up the computer separately, getting software that we think we would work, we just need to be able to click on the button and say record, and we would be recording. Uh, in addition to the whiteboard, what it has is uh, text and voice uh, communication built in, as we do, but also web camera support. So there are a lot of things that are built in. 
uh, and uh, I think you see them down here at the bottom so that you can actually do your PowerPoint presentations. You could share your desktop. Uh, you've even got stickers there and uh, online polls. So a little bit of a feel like a Collaborate that you might be used to working in if you're a uh, student, one of our students, and used to working in, in the classrooms and Collaborate. Um, there are videos on this page. If you just look for the uh, Virtual Academy, and I think uh, I had that link on this last page, um, but this will be available to you yeah, right up here. Uh, if you just go there, you will see these videos, and uh, you click on them, and you could see what it's like. The exciting thing for me that I heard is that the instructors were able to record their session, and if a student missed the session, the students could replay the session but be part of that session, actually feel as if they were in the classroom with the other students that were there. Uh, so it, I, I have not uh, gotten into it that far, but really, really exciting. Same premise though, we've got to save it somehow, but they're trying to save the environment, they're trying to save the interaction, and they're trying to do it in a way that if you missed it, you could get back in there and feel as if you were still there. So I, I think that was a pretty, uh, pretty neat option. Okay, but getting back to us, what is our option? Uh, our option is really the machinima. We're going to uh, preserve our virtual worlds. Uh, the link that I have there, or at least the reference, is uh, I think to Henry Lowood's work there. Uh, he was working with a couple of other colleges. There's the University of Illinois. Um, there's a final report, and actually in the final report, after lots of money and lots of work with professors at different universities, what they came up with is that machinima is a really great way to document the creativity that was expressed during the classes as well as the content not only of the virtual worlds but of a different type of gaming as well and uh, so we are still there uh, I have not found yet a way to actually preserve the environment unless we looked at a classroom like that academia that I showed you where it's a recording of a classroom but you can go back in a way that you feel that you're in it or unless it's like those building blocks uh, saving your objects and replicating them again and in all of those cases it's a lot of work so really what we have to do is document and what we're going to document using would be the machinima and uh, you will be uh, learning a little more how to do that uh, later on. I think on Wednesday, uh, you're going to have a Val Wood come in and she'll talk to you about machinima. She's done many of them for our classes. What I did want to do uh, right now um, before um, we quit uh, is take a look at archives in France because you, of course, are living in France. What do they think is important? Uh, in their archives, and I, I wonder if you're kind of thinking the same thing or not. I don't know. Uh, but actually, the Archives National, uh, which is the French National Archives, uh, was developed in uh, 1790, uh, and it was created because they had objects that they wanted to preserve. And by 1794, there was a decree that said you absolutely had to centralize all of the pre-revolutionary objects, records, public and private, and bring them to the archives. These were seized by the revolutionaries, and there had to be a home for them. And so that is why, yep, one of the first uh, national archives. And uh, they, uh, of course, then it's been in existence, what, more than 12 centuries already. So uh, uh, it's uh, a very um, exciting, I think, time to be living in in your virtual world. Um, one of the objects that they have uh, is shown here, and it's one of the oldest records uh, dating back to 695. And uh, it belongs uh, to the Basilica of St. Denis. If you take a look at it, the, the handwriting is beautiful. The paper is a little crumpled. 
but it still perseveres. We still have it. Um, I wonder uh, with our digital objects, our, our letters, our email, uh, if in the future we're going to be able to pull something up and show what it looks like. Uh, it's That's the challenge, I think, with the digital information that we're all trying to uh, meet, to resolve. Now, that old building was beautiful, but in France, the National Archives hasn't given up. They still value uh, their treasures, their cultural heritage. And so uh, what they did uh, was build a uh, wonderful uh, 108,000 uh, square meter um, new archives. Uh, and it was designed by Italian archivists. And it took three years, uh, I think, to actually uh, open it to the public after. Uh, it, they have uh, had to, of course, get it ready uh, for the public to come in and view. And it does hold the uh, documents. Now, we talk about objects when we think of archives, physical objects. I know that. But, but the original archives, the original uh, documentation of the events, the records, is the reason for the archives. It's not for a beautiful bust or it's not for, you know, that Coca-Cola uh, recipe that is uh, preserved down in Atlanta there, although those are valuable and belong in an archives. But it, it really was because there were political records from political regimes uh, from the 17th century until today that had to be preserved and, and documented. And at the time, that information was important for them, but it also became important later on for researchers. So um, if you visit any archive at all, I think um, you would find a uh, wealth of information. Uh, you could just get lost in. And of course, there are physical uh, uh, objects there as well. Um, France has uh, 95 uh, administrative divisions, uh, departments, and each of them has their own archives. Uh, and uh, some of their collections date back to the 15th century, but the oldest reside in the National Archives of France. They also, though, recognize the digital heritage, and so you will find that they do have collections available digitally through the uh, uh, French National Archives. They also do a great job, um, just off, off side here, uh, preserving their um, websites, uh, the public uh, websites. Uh, they look at it as a national obligation. We don't do that in the United States. Ours is kind of haphazard, hit or miss. So now we're going to take a look at what we have here uh, in Vakara, and we have a temple of artifacts. And I think Faleen, I'm not sure if she's here, uh, I don't think in this class, uh, created uh, all the signs. So this week I actually know which buildings are called what, uh, although, yep, the sign is hanging down there. Uh, and this is the temple of artifacts. And uh, Marie has worked to put a lot of um, machinima in here. Uh, snow work to build the building, uh, and this this building is absolutely uh, wonderful for me because it has glass floors right in the center and really terrific staircases that you can follow. On the main floor, right on the bottom, and it's right next to us behind my presentation here, uh, what you can do is wander around and uh, look at the machinima that was created by people in previous classes. Uh, we have the Tudors there, and then I think we also have the Italian Re Renaissance there. So we have two sections down on the main floor uh, when you could go in and you could click on the machine and get ideas for what other students have done, uh, and maybe for your own projects. And you'll see what we mean about trying to find a way to preserve your wonderful work, and the best way we can think of right now is just by making the machinima. And now our challenge will be how do we organize this? How do we preserve it? How do we display it in a way that makes it accessible uh, for anybody who would like to visit uh, our space and see what kind of projects have been going on? And uh, we're still working on that. <laughs> but we've got a wonderful group of volunteers uh, each semester who uh, contribute to the work on the island and who try to help us deal with these issues. So the temple is where you want to go if you want to get ideas for your own work. 
Uh, and here's just a video of three of the um, machinima in the back of that bottom floor. You just wander in the back. You'll take a look. If you click on them, uh, you could see the work that has been done. Uh, so that's just the inside of our, our downstairs there. And now this, uh, a few of us were, were talking, uh, and the article that I referred to before that said we should be preserving community, uh, they were talking in that article about not only preserving the artifacts and the community, but the, the, the people and the way things are happening, not only as just a video, but through other social media. And um, th we do have a Pinterest board uh, that uh, we started way last year, I think. So uh, some of the images that we take are uploaded there to our Virtual Worlds Pinterest board. Uh, we also have, uh, and you could view that, and uh, we still have students who are working on that. Uh, we also have um, a YouTube channel uh, for Vicara. And so the videos, as I said, that are in our main floor there, some of them are also posted to the YouTube channel so they can be viewed that way. Uh, this was Kim's presentation just in September that took place right here. And so this is one of the videos that can be seen either uh, through a display right here in Second Life or through um, YouTube. And uh, now, I've come to the end, and uh, I know that Lori had talked about uh, getting you your assignment. So she's sent that out already, uh, and so I won't be going over that. But I just want you to know that there are plenty of examples there. And I think Lori uh, is taking you on another trip to uh, Renaissance Island, so you may not have time to do that now. Uh, but um, you can certainly, uh, if you have a few minutes and want to, uh, take a walk. Yep, you're going to Renaissance Island. Okay. So I'm not going to take you over there, but I'm just going to show you that if you walk down here and then turn to the right, you're in the next building where all of the displays are for you to be able to view. And uh, do anybody have any questions? So I think mainly I want you to start thinking about preservation as a serious uh, concern. Uh, and then what's the best thing we could do right now with the work that you've created? How can we best preserve that?